Yup, let's get original crew, man. We're back. We have a ballin' top three photos with disturbing bad stories. This is part 13. You ready for a part three tonight, see? I'm ready. See, like, I'm a little tired, y'all. I am, too. I'm a little bit. Oh, you more than a little bit? I said I'm a little bit. I'm a little tired. You said more than a little bit. I Did swear I heard you. Yes, you said that. I don't one. even know. But we still gonna knock out these videos for y'all tonight, Most man. Ever. So, hey, with that being said, before we get into it, make sure you check out the links in the description box. It's down below. You already know where to go if you want the first part. All you have to do is check out down below. Also, if you enjoyed today's visuals. Like it with a thumbs up. But with that being said, let's go ahead and hop into three photos with disturbing bad stories. This, again, part 13. Let's go. Let's check it out. Let's see what it's about. Today, I'm going to share with you three progressively more disturbing stories, and at the end of each of them, I'm going to share with you the picture or pictures that are famously associated with them. But before I get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, and you've come to the right channel because that's all I do and I upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please wait for the like button to be taking a shower and then flush the toilet. Also, please subscribe to this channel. Uh, you remember when that used to happen though? Have you ever experienced that? Mm -mm. So you taking a shower, somebody coming and flush the toilet? And the water go cold. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You never experienced that? Oh, now, if you do it, I don't think it. I don't think it affects it much. But we used to do it back in the day. Mm -hmm. Like I, I have experienced it before. I'd be like, motherfucker, why you come in the bathroom? You no, know, I'm in the shower. Y'all ain't never experienced that. I. Yeah. I don't think so. No. Oh, uh, I have. It sucks though, because the water gets like cold, cold. You be like, ah! like button to be taking a shower and then flush the toilet also please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads all right let's get into today's stories Andrew McCauley was an adventurer. He started as a rock climber and mountaineer, putting up dozens of big wall routes in Australia, as well as alpine first ascents in New Zealand, Patagonia, and the Himalayas in the 1990s. He took little interest in the marquee peaks. He preferred obscure, lesser known peaks that were more challenging and complex. But in 1998, he fell nearly 30 meters during a climb and shattered his knee, which made it almost impossible to climb at the level he was climbing at before the injury. This injury that initially seemed like a really big setback because he loved mountain climbing, it ultimately spawned his true life passion that he didn't even know about, and that was sea kayaking. He took to kayaking because it didn't really require the use of his legs, and so he was able to continue to push the limits of his mental and physical endurance, but wasn't hampered by a knee injury. And much like his mountain climbing career, he very quickly began conquering all of the most difficult open ocean kayaking routes all around Australia and New Zealand to the point where he had done all of them. The only one he had not done was the Tasman Sea. Andrew estimated it would take him approximately one month or maybe a little bit longer to cross the 1,000 mile journey. Now, his biggest obstacle was not going to be his own physical or mental endurance. It was going to be the weather because you're gonna be out on the water for at least 30 days. There really isn't a weather window you can shoot for. You can't time this journey so you don't hit a storm. It's more about when you hit the storms, how will your kayak hold up? Other kayakers that had attempted going across the Tasman Sea had used these custom-built kayaks that had these elaborate canopies over the top of them, and they had these self-writing systems where if it flipped, it automatically popped right back up. But Andrew wanted to do it with just a basic kayak. He didn't want all the bells and whistles. He wanted this to be kind of pure. But he did need to create a sort of system to protect himself in the middle of one of these storms. And so he literally went into his backyard and constructed this fiberglass that looked like a trash can that sat over his cockpit on the kayak. 
that he could remove and put on the back of his kayak. And then if he wanted to sleep, he could put it over him and it was sealed and watertight and it would protect him from the storm. And if he flipped over, he wouldn't just sink and drown. He called this dome Casper and he painted a big smiley face on it. And so after months and months of preparing for this journey, finally on January 11th, 2007, Andrew would kiss his wife and his young son goodbye. He would hop in his kayak along with Casper and he would set sail on his solo journey across the Tasman Sea. For the first two thirds of the trip, it seemed to be going extremely well. Andrew was checking in regularly on his radio. He had enough food and water. His kayak was holding up. Casper was holding up great at night, so he was able to get some sleep. But some really bad storms that he was anticipating began rolling in kind of all at once in that final third of the journey. During one particularly bad storm, Andrew would remain locked underneath Casper for 28 straight hours as these 30 foot waves would just wreak havoc outside, flipping his kayak over multiple times. I mean, just absolutely terrifying stuff. Inside his kayak, he had this beacon that if he pushed the button, it would send a GPS signal to the rescue crew that would immediately come out and they would save him. And the whole time he's getting thrashed around out in the middle of the ocean, he never presses the button. Because much like he didn't want to have all the bells and whistles on his kayak, he also didn't want any help. So instead he would send kind of sarcastic text messages to the people on shore, making light of the situation he was in. Like during this storm, he sent a text message that just said, no picnic today. 12 days after that particular storm where he was locked inside for 28 hours, he had made it to within 80 miles of the finish line. And so he texts his wife and just says, see you Sunday at 9 a.m. This was on a Thursday. And so when his wife, Vicky, gets this text message, she's so excited. She gets together everybody that wants to meet him at the finish line. And in fact, they all go there early on Thursday to just hang out and camp out until he arrives. But 24 hours after that text message was sent to his wife, Andrew would send a distress signal to the New Zealand Coast Guard. On the recording, Andrew sounds desperate. He also sounds deeply fatigued or maybe even hypothermic. And he's pleading with them to come rescue him because his kayak is sinking. At first, people- Why he just didn't hit the beacon? The... I understand you hit the phone and stuff, yeah, I don't, but- I don't, I don't, That's a good question, I don't know. Cause then, cause it's in a GPS locator. So even if you are sinking, it must have got the kayak itself must have caught a hole in it somewhere. Yeah. Have you ever never felt a kayak or anything? Mm mm. Uh, no. No, I'm not. I'm not saying like <laughs> you ever been in one. Oh. What I'm saying, you have saying? you ever felt one? Have you ever seen like? Oh yeah, yeah. You never touched one though. Just I touched it. Where you touch one at see? Like in the stores? <laughs> <laughs> like when they have them in the stores. What they feel like? I, I can't remember. Plastic maybe? <laughs> I don't know. I can't remember what they feel like. Have you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and he's pleading with them to come rescue him because his kayak is sinking. At first, people, including the Coast Guard, thought this could be a hoax because Andrew was so competent out on the water and he had just gotten in touch with his wife the day earlier saying, everything's great, I'm almost done, I've made it past all the hard stuff, I'll see you on Sunday. But of course, they still send out a search crew oh, that night to look for say. Andrew. They can't find him. So the next day on Saturday, they expand their search and they do find Andrew's kayak, except oh. Andrew's not in it. The only thing missing was the canopy to the kayak. The rest of the kayak seemed to work just fine. His distress beacon had not been pressed. His GPS was still there and his camera was still there. No one knows what happened to Andrew in his final hours before he ultimately disappeared. The prevailing theory is he must have been capsized wow. and separated from his kayak and then was unable to either get back to it or even climb back in because he was so, so tired. tired. This is the final picture that was taken on Andrew's camera. And you can tell from his expression that he's not particularly happy to be in the situation he's in. Wow. And in fact, in some of the earlier video clips he shot, he actually says to the camera that he feels like he bit off more than he could chew and that he wishes he could just be home with his wife and his son. Aww. Despite extensive search efforts, Andrew was never found. Damn. It's always sad when situations like this happen and you and the body is never recovered. You know what I'm saying? You know what's... Because I... Oh, wow. It's, 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 it's horrible to think of, though. Mm -hmm. 
But I always think of like when they say they can't find a body or the body is no longer. I'm like, all right, so either the body is on the ocean floor, mm-hmm. like sunken all the way down to the ocean floor, or is it possible an uh, animal ate the body? Yeah, those are possibilities. And I'm like, so damn, weird. that would be fucked up. You know what I'm saying? That's, yeah. why I, that's why I keep my ass out the water. I feel you. Because sometimes I think some people get carried away and they keep chasing. It's like a, they're chasing a high. That's mm-hmm. what we want. I don't go skydiving. I don't like, I don't do a lot of certain things because I know, like, if you accomplish certain things, you're like, oh, I can do it. I can do it again. I can do it again. I can do it again. And sometimes you got to you gotta know your limitations. And a lot but of people. You, you, oh, sorry. No, you go. I was about to say, but you have a lot of people that's super, like, fearless when it comes to stuff. And they but are, like, living on, those, living on the edge. And that's the things that, like, make them happy. And But fortunately, yeah. those. Be yeah, the, I some, A lot of times, those be the people who, unfortunately, I get what things happen to. I guess. I guess. Yeah, true. And obviously, another thing I was thinking about, I was like, did he have, possibly have a life jacket on? Because I understand you could swim, mm-hmm. but can you swim for that long? True. Because at least if you have a life jacket on, you won't have to constantly try to, you can probably, possibly get to a point where you can just relax and float. The, yeah. The only thing I'm like, dang, I just wish that, like, I understand he wanted to do it like the, like, more raw and just mm-hmm. like you know authentic or whatever the case but i just wish maybe like the with um the the, uh, yeah with like if it flip over to flip it, like those yeah. type you know you could still do it and just but i guess like, he, he's like that's not doing it. it like real raw organic yeah i get it like you're not really kayaking you're using a special equipment to yeah so i definitely get it but it's it. yeah but it's just like the distance we're covering it's just it's different yeah so sure i agree In 2005, Addie Hall met Zach Bowen when they were both bartending in New Orleans. Addie liked to give Zach a really hard time and kind of played the mean girl as her way of flirting with him. But really what she was doing is testing Zach to see if he could put up with her because she had a mean streak. She would have these crazy, angry outbursts and would yell and scream at people around her. And then she'd turn it off just like that. And she needed to make sure that he could put up with her. Zach, it would turn out, had his own mean streak and his own angry outbursts. And so in many ways, they were very similar. Many of Zach and Addie's friends that were around them in those first few weeks they were together did not think this relationship would last very long because of how often they fought with each other. But it just so happened that Zach and Addie had met one another just weeks before Hurricane Katrina came through Mm. New Orleans and just devastated the area. And so before it arrived, Zach and Addie decide Let's stick it out. Let's stay here together. Let's Mm. ride the storm out together. Mm. And it was actually that storm that brought them together. And they both fell madly in love with each other and became totally inseparable. After the storm cleared, Zach and Addie went out into the streets and began cooking food for people. And they had all this alcohol in their apartment. And they set up a makeshift bar outside in the French Quarter and were just giving away drinks to these people whose lives had been devastated by the storm. Their tale of love and colorful survivalism attracted many media outlets, including the New York Times, who did a feature on them. For a time, Zach and Addie felt like the king and queen of the French Quarter, and they were so happy. But when reality set back in, and the real cleanup ensued, and electricity was restored, and people started moving back into their homes, and people started going to work again, Zach and Addie were forced back into their old lifestyle, something neither of them wanted to experience again. So for the next year, Zach and Addie struggled to make ends meet. Their bills continued to pile up. And really, those two were at each other's throats all the time with these horrible, vicious fights. In October of 2006, when it seems like Zach and Addie's relationship is really on the rocks, they decide in order to reinvigorate their relationship, they're going to move out of their current apartment where there's lots of bad memories, and they're going to move into a new one. They found a little apartment over the famed Voodoo Temple on Rampart Street, and they immediately made a cash offer, and they moved in. No sooner had they moved in did Addie go down to the landlord and say, remove Zach from the lease. She had found out that he was cheating on her, and she was preparing to kick him out of her life. Zach found out that he was not on the lease before Addie could confront him about it, and it turned into this wicked fight between the two of them. A couple of days later, Zach showed up for work at the bar, and some of his co-workers were called that he was acting really funny. He was wearing a hat pulled down low over his head and sunglasses and was really quiet. And when anybody asked him, like, what's going on with you? Why are you acting so strange? He would just tell them he was fine and would quickly walk away from them. 
Around the same time, Addie stopped showing up for work at all. And her coworkers turned to Zach and said, where's Addie? And he would say that they got into this fight and that Addie had actually left New Orleans and gone back to her hometown in North Carolina. And some people thought that was a little bit fishy because Addie loved New Orleans, but anybody that knew Addie knew she was very unpredictable. And if they had had this huge blowout fight, it is possible that she could have left for North Carolina. A week later, on October 17th, 2006, the New Orleans police receive a phone call from a hotel in the area that spotted what they think is a body laying on the roof of their parking garage. When the police arrived, they could tell it was a deceased man and that he had died from impact, but they couldn't tell if it was a murder, a suicide, or a tragic accident. So they began searching his body to see if there was any indication of what happened. And they pull out a note that's addressed to police in his back pocket. The note is fairly long, but he communicates to the police that this was not an accident. I had to take my own life because I took a life. And if you go to my apartment on oh. Rampart Street, you'll find the body of my girlfriend, Addie Hall, who I killed. Police rush to the address that was given in the note. They're horrified at what they find inside. As soon as they stepped into the apartment, the temperature dropped. The air- Whoa. That is crazy, bro. And just his actions alone, he because he automatically changed. Because like like a lot of people say, if you take once you take a, I've heard people say once you take a life, you're never the same anymore. Like you like that that changes you. Yeah. Like being in certain experiences just yeah. changes changes a person because it's not something a, a, a human is supposed to do. We're not mm -hmm. supposed to, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. you're you're never the same anymore. But his actions just. Uh, always screamed out red flag. Red, yeah, like, like very alarming. If you, if you pay attention, something that happens. Mm -hmm. You like even though she, she was very unpredictable. I doubt she's just gonna pack up and leave without telling anybody. Especially like the, if, if especially she, since she, both of them like fought it out through the uh, uh the hurricane. Car yeah, Katrina. Yeah, and all of that. She stayed there during all that. Like a fight. Alone, it's not going to like. Okay, I'm going to go home. It'll break them up, but it's not, gonna, it's not going to. It's not going to push her to go back to North Carolina. No, I, no. Of my girlfriend Addie Hall, who I killed. Police rush to the address that was given in the note. They're horrified at what they find inside. As soon as they stepped into the apartment, the temperature dropped. The air conditioning had been set to the lowest it could possibly be, so it's very cold in the apartment. And they look around and they see these strange messages spray painted all over the walls. Things like, I'm a total failure, and look in the oven. And there are what? arrows pointing on the walls towards the kitchen and towards the oven itself that's sitting in the kitchen. And sure enough, when they open up the oven, they find Addie. Police also found Addie's journal, and inside of it, Zach had left an eight-page, very detailed confession of how he had strangled Addie and then had tried to cook her to make it easier to dispose of her body, wow. but couldn't finish the job, and that's when he went to the hotel and threw himself off. Here are some crime scene photos from outside the apartment as well as inside. You can see some of the messages that Zach had spray painted to the wall indicating to go check the oven. And here is the infamous oven where Addie's remains were found as well as a message left in the kitchen saying that he was sorry he couldn't finish in reference to his inability to finish cooking her and disposing of her body. Crazy as it sounds, this apartment is still being rented out today and it includes this exact stove. Oh, hell no. Ain't no way in hell I'm um, living no, there. You, I, you staying there? Me personally, no. But I know some people, especially if the rent is cheap. And that rent cheap, cheap. You know what I'm saying? Even A to lot this, of people would. Even to this day, that rent is cheap, cheap. Why the fuck you ain't got rid of the stove? At least if you go still have an apartment. 2006? We got better stoves now. Even on that end. Facts. What the fuck? So just imagine, just imagine all these people who have literally cooked their dinner in this stove. That's crazy. And I understand, like financial wise, some people just like. Uh, but at the end of the day, you don't know how gruesome that crime scene actually really was. For him to cut her body up. To even try to cook it down, to destroy it, to dispose it easily. That's I wonder crazy. how. How far did he even get? That's like what, what? How much leftover remains was there? 
for it to even fit into the oven. And that's the final remains. That's not that much. Well, it can be. It can it be. It can be. Because we don't. Did nobody I'm... say, yo, your bed. Like, even around him, say, bro, your behavior. Because your behavior changes when you're going through that. Even spray painting and stuff. That means you're not sleeping. You're not eating. But no one is seeing that part. Even when he goes to work, you're seeing him. That's the only thing that, like, his, like you're seeing, like, okay, something is strange. Even, even like, his friend group or if he's hanging out with people, that shit was just, that was show. Yeah, it must Like, have been. certain things would show itself. You know what I'm saying? Even if you're not looking for it, certain, I don't know. I think, I'm like, no one thought to, like, did she have, like, a hey, can phone? Can I come over? Do you need somebody... Hell no, nah, I didn't want to go over this, bro. Well, would, I'm talking about if, for if you her. Have, what I'm saying is, say for instance, you wanted his friends be like, hey, I'm going to come over, kick it with you. If you have been able to spot something, he probably would have killed you too. True, but I'm saying like for her, her, like no one thought to like probably like call her. I'm like, did she have a phone? Like no one was able to like to ever get in touch. With her personality being so turn on, turn off, a lot of people probably was like, all right, I'll just leave her alone. It's just, you know, it's just her. We'll give her some time. She'll come and around. I even give her a time because she, she can easily just snap on you and just be done with you, it seems like. So she, they probably was like, hey, that's just who she is. She's moving on with her <laughs> life. And, but it's hard for people to just move on without letting people know, hey, I'm moving on. Mm-hmm. Especially when you're literally leaving. Yeah. You're not leaving because of them. You're leaving if if she was if she was to leave you're not leaving because of them. You're leaving because of him. Yeah. So it's more like you would low key still let them know that you. Leave. Yeah, because I'm like even if I am like I have my little moments where I'm like you know crazy one minute and I'm cool the next. I want to still I be like, in contact stay with somebody or just like tell my friends goodbye. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I don't know. I mean everyone is different. Yeah, you that's know? the biggest thing. So yeah. Who knows, man? But that's sad. Very much so sad. Hisachi Aoichi was married, had a young son. He smoked a pack of cigarettes a day. He played rugby in high school. And by 1999, he was employed as a technician at the JCO Tokimura Power Plant. He and his colleagues had been tasked with creating the fuel for a fast reactor called Joyo. Since 1993, the company JCO that owns this power plant that Aoichi works for, they had been cutting a lot of corners to increase productivity and profitability, but at the expense of safety. In fact, the company had their own in-house rules that totally went against nuclear power plant regulations. They called this the shadow guide, and within the shadow guide, there were very specific steps that were totally unsafe and unregulated to create this fuel for this Joyo fast reactor. On September 30th, 1999, Aoichi was creating this Joyo fuel and he was leaning over this large steel containment tank and he was holding a funnel. One of his colleagues was above the tank, pouring in this potent solution through the funnel into the tank. The tank they were using that was prescribed under the shadow guide was not actually designed to hold the amount of radioactive materials that were being put inside of it. And so as Aoichi and his colleague are creating this mixture, a very dangerous event occurred known as critical. One of the survivors who was sitting away from the tank behind a desk described this event as being an extremely loud bang followed by this blue flash that filled the entire room. And what that blue light was, was extremely high levels of radiation. And because Aoichi was the one kind of leaning over the tank, it all went right through him. By the time a rescue crew got in the room to help them, Aoichi is uncontrollably vomiting and he's lightheaded and dizzy. He does not have any physical wounds. This was not an explosion. So there's no lacerations or anything on his body. But he had been exposed to 17 sieverts of radiation, which is the highest amount of radiation any human being has ever been exposed to in documented history. Aoichi was airlifted to a hospital and doctors and nurses were actually kind of amazed at how well he was doing in those first few days. Again, he did not have any burn marks or anything on his body. He did have a little bit of redness on his right arm, which was positioned directly over the tank when this criticality event occurred. But he was in good spirits and was even joking around with the staff about how he can't wait to get home. 
in reality, Aoji died as soon as he was exposed to that criticality event and received 17 sieverts of radiation. He was in what's known as walking ghost phase, where due to high levels of radiation, all of his chromosomes had been obliterated, which meant his body did not have a blueprint to reproduce cells. So basically, he appeared alive and well because his body had created all of these cells in his body before the accident, but as those cells died off, they would not be reproduced, which means in walking ghost phase, your body is turning into a corpse, but you're alive to watch it happen. Mm. Tragically- I ain't never heard no shit like that before. Have you? Not necessarily. This is new. What the f- But after he said his body was exposed to that radiation, I was like, child. But, and he oh. said the amount, I said, um, how he even still alive? That's what I was in my head. I was like, how he even still alive? But then I never heard like, like detail. Like that's how like over time like works. Like if you expose to that high amount, then technically you don't die like, immediately. It's you don't, like, yeah, you literally. Oh, you. you he's inside talking, you are. He's being responsive. He's doing everything. Literally, he knows you. You actually like cell wise, you are, but you still alert and talking That's yourself. Crazy, but bro. yeah, is your body is turning into a corpse, but you're alive to watch it happen. Tragically, after doctors discovered this about his condition and they informed Aochi of what was going on, Aochi did not seem to think there could be that serious of consequences for being exposed to that level of radiation. He felt like he was in the clear. He had made it past a couple of days. He thought maybe at worst he would develop leukemia later in life because he thought that was a thing with radiation. And really his concern was that he might have to stay in the hospital for a little bit longer. He just wanted to go home. Three weeks after the accident, his intestines began to hemorrhage and his skin fell off, mm. all of it. Mm. They attempted numerous skin grafts to try to keep his bodily fluids inside of him but none of them took, so they began wrapping him in gauze like he was a mummy. By November 27th, which is two months after the accident, miraculously, he was still alive. However, his pain levels were so high, they had to put him into a medically induced coma. While he was in the coma, his heart would stop and he would need to be resuscitated three separate times. And on the third time he was brought back, he would say, stop, stop, get out of the room, leave me alone. But they didn't stop because the doctors and nurses were very interested in studying the effects Bitch. of this level of. I, this man is in in pain. He's tired. That's, let me go, please. Let me go. That, if I'm begging you. That's what happened with my uh, my aunt's husband Chill. when he died. Not last year, but the year before. They brought him back to life. He had basically had died several times. And they brought him back to life a couple times, and, he, and he, they say he actually told them, like, like, let me go, like I'm, I'm done, like let me go. Like, I'm tired. And, and they said she told him, like, you, are you just basically kind of you can't give up, but if they, he was like, I, I just want to go be with my mom, mm -hmm. and I was like, damn, that's crazy when somebody's wanting, like, you know what I'm saying, literally, like. That's because he was in that much pain. Yeah, like when you're like high levels of pain like that, and you're like because he's not feeling it no more. When I'm 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 dead, but then y'all bring me back. Now I'm back into the pain, and then I'm gone, and then I'm coming. Like let me fucking leave. I yeah. I understand, but it's like like dang, it's yeah. still like it still sucks. Though. Yeah. yeah stop because the doctors and nurses were very interested in studying the effects of That's this selfish. level of radiation and how well he would respond to treatment and just trying to learn as much as they could about this event because it had never happened before and they probably justified it by saying this will save other people's lives but what that meant is Aochi would need to suffer unbelievable levels of pain right. nearing the end when Aochi could still speak he told the doctors and nurses repeatedly that he is not a guinea pig Finally, a do not resuscitate order was put in place, and in relative short order, Aoji passed away after 83 days of just unbelievable agony. Wow. The truly famous picture that is associated with this story is unbelievably graphic, and I did not want to share it 
on this channel. However, if you feel so inclined, it's not that difficult to find online. This picture, however, is equally disturbing because it's of Aochi right after he's arrived at the hospital. He is in that walking ghost face. All of his chromosomes have been obliterated. He is effectively dead right now in this picture. He just doesn't know it yet. So that's going to do it, guys. Let me know what you thought of these three stories, and I'll pin the best comment at the top of the comment section. If you enjoyed today's story and you haven't done this already, please wait for the like button to be taking a shower and then flush the toilet. Also, oh, my bad, my bad. I normally pause. <laughs> Stop it before. before. <laughs> no, I was just thinking. Honestly, but to go back to you um, asking me the question, no. I really haven't. Because I was really thinking, I was like, have I ever heard anything like this before? No. Like, you know, you hear about people getting exposed to, like, you know, le you know, whatever levels of radiation. But no, I had never heard of anything particularly like this. This is Was that him? Um, oh. Uh, that's what it is. Oh, shit. Oh, yeah. That's from, I guess that's from that's the from glass. after, yeah, after the fact. These photos ain't bad, though. Oh, jeez. Oh, wow. I was like, I'm pretty sure it gets worse over time. Oh, oh. my gosh. Yo. Wow. Oh, yeah, I'm telling you the same shit. And y'all, like, you don't even have, you shouldn't have to tell somebody that. That alone, I, I, I see, baby. That alone, why? This whole leg came off. And this one, that's one leg right there, but the other leg is gone. It's really disintegrated from his... He literally is a walking corpse. And you shouldn't have to tell someone, like, please stop bringing me back to life. Like, the condition that those pictures are in. Damn. That's pain. Like, that's agony. That's pain, bro. Just imagine somebody Just with... Just for you to do experiments and like, hey... What's like, the uh, worst degree burn? But that's times a uh, thousand. Yeah. Like, literally, you know how you see burn victims? And like, but think of that as like fresh. Mm -hmm. Fresh, I'm just trying to get them like, but fresh wound and it's not healing. Yeah. Like, literally, you saw his multiple... That was his, his whole skin. That was just muscle. That is pain, bro. Because you know how, like, white meat, all the way down to the white meat, and that really be painful? Just imagine, like, your skin is 100% gone, and all you have is the muscle that's over your body, and that's what's exposed. That it's is just pain. tendons and stuff. Yeah, that is painful. That's the worst pain any human has probably ever been through. And I live know, through, and y'all wouldn't. And then you think about it, y'all resuscitate me, y'all, y'all are. That's on, on my no, no. I don't even want to think about it. I'm like, let's please. That's Just, painful, <laughs> bro. Yeah, like I wouldn't wish that on no one, child, to but have to go through that. But for, for sure, for eighty three days. Yeah. Just agony. Yeah. Like I'm I'm telling you I'm ready to go. Y'all just keep on, hey, not right now. We still got a few things we wanna like But for sure, what? man. RP to these individuals. Yeah, yeah uh, RP to each. Even Zach, man, RP. Uh it seems I when in situations like that, especially like especially with I can't you can't necessarily say, but he did feel the guilt from doing it. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And who knows if that's what he really wanted to do or, or it was in the moment. You get what I'm saying? Not everybody who kills somebody is killing somebody because they want to, want to or that's like, I'm a killer. Sometimes, they, I don't know. I can't, ju I'm not finna justify. I can't justify that. I ain't justified. I, I'm saying I can't justify and I'm not trying to and justify. I'm just saying because at the end of the day, he still is an individual whose family is mourning from his death as well. Yeah, I feel you. So, but most definitely R.P. Addy, because she didn't deserve any no, of that. No, not, especially with the fact that she found out you were cheating, bro. And she just wanted your name off the lease. Well, she and got your name she, off the lease. She wanted she to, to out. Yeah. You know, like. Move just, on with her life. 
without you. And it's, it'd be that control factor, bro, in a lot of relationships. They, it's just... That's, that's I don't just know, sad, but man. yeah. And she didn't deserve that. Uh, she she didn't deserve to get killed or her her course being put through that. She didn't deserve that at all. And then Andrew, I, I hate it for his family because mm-hmm. his family wasn't even able to have a proper burial. You know what I'm saying? And it's even more sad with, like, with his because mm-hmm. everyone, like, came, like, you know, to welcome no. him. Like, at and the finish line, they came a little wife early. And wife and kid, you know. That's sad. Yeah, man. that's sad. And then y'all just was getting photos from him. Then uh, 24 hours later, he's just gone. You don't yeah. even know where he's at. That's sad, bro. Yeah. That's devastating. I repeat to each and every All these individual. situations was very devastating, man. Most definitely was. Hey, man, y'all spend us up. Let us know y'all thoughts about it in the comment section down below, man. But as always, y'all know how it go, man. I do go with the name DJ Kid. That's it. We are. 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 We